We are going to have our next session, which is about employee engagement. So you will hear again from Anne and Eric. And this topic will be with an expert, Caroline Webb. Uh, and we will start in just a few moments. Do make sure that you're filling out the survey between sessions. We want to measure that emotion throughout the day and see how we're doing. And check in online. You'll see more of the sketch notes from Adrian as we move forward. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am uh, honored to introduce our guest speaker for the employee engagement session at the Human Advantage Conference. Nao and Sharon, who is VP Behavioral Science and Innovation at BVA People at Work Consulting and one of the BVA's group champion for employee engagement, and myself will be speaking with Caroline Webb. Caroline is an executive coach, author, and speaker known for being one of the world's leading experts in using insight from behavioral science to improve professional life. Her best-selling book, I have to say that I have loved this book. It was a really haha moment for me. In French, we say a wow moment. So her best-selling book on that topic, how to have a good day, I am maybe one of the only to have two versions of the book, a French one and the uh, English uh, version has been published in 17 editions, I think, and over 60 countries. She is also a senior advisor to McKinsey, where she was previously a partner. So welcome, Caroline. A big thank you to be with us. We are very excited to have you at the Human Advantage Conference. So let's start. Uh, hi, Caroline. Good to see you. Uh, a lot of your work, uh, some of it detailed in uh, how to have a good day, focuses on engagement, performance, well-being at work, and what uh, each of us can do to improve our own work experience in terms of setting the right priorities, building relationships, maintaining resilience and joie de vivre. So I guess my first question for you today is, why is it so challenging to have a good day at work? <laughs> well, of course, I like to lead with, it is possible to have a good day at work. But yes, I mean, there are challenges. And I think you can pick out, you know, very specific uh, aspects of the the workplace that you might be in right now. But I think the general point is just it's a very complex system. You know, as soon as you have multiple humans interacting, each with their own desires and needs uh, and inner thoughts, and you've got the complexity of economic and social forces acting on, on your workplace, you're, you're in a very complex system. And the thing about complex systems is that nobody really controls them. You just have to look for the points of control um, that have disproportionate influence on the system. And you know, I think everybody feels this at different points in their career. It might show up differently. But I was talking, I, I, my day job is in executive coaching. I was talking to a client just a couple of weeks ago and he was saying, it doesn't matter what I do. There's always something, you know, you, you try to control everything else and then something else pops up. And so we were laughing about that. And of course, we all feel a little bit like that. But behavioral science is extremely helpful in helping us understand where we do have control and where those points of disproportionate influence are in the, the little system that sits around us. So uh, that's why the work that you're doing on this is so, is so powerful and so helpful. That's a great, thank you very much. And that's a great transition to my next question, actually, which is, well, can you tell us some of the key insights from uh, behavioral science um, and how to apply them to have a good day? Basically? Well, of course, I've got a hundred, hundred tips. Um, I think a good filter would be what am I working on perhaps most with, uh, with my clients just right now. Um, that's as, as good a way of choosing as any. Um, I'll pick uh, one that's very deep and one that's very practical. The one that's very deep is uh, based on the science of selective attention, which I think probably everybody listening here will be somewhat familiar with. That's the idea that however smart we are, we have a limited amount of conscious attention. Our brain is constantly making selections about where we should be directing that conscious attention. And that there is a rule of thumb 
our brains love rules of thumb, uh, that tends to guide where we put that small stock of conscious attention. And it tends to be whatever we're already thinking about. And that might be, uh, for example, it might be a goal that we have. So we call that inattentional blindness, where we don't see anything that's not on point for the goal uh, that we have in front of us. And, you know, many of you will have, will associate this with studies involving gorillas, <laughs> where, you, where people fail to see a gorilla because they're not looking for it. But there are other types of um, uh, what I call this sort of top of mind effect as well. I mean, there's sometimes we call it salience uh, bias, you know, where we're affected by something we've just seen. And so that information looms much larger than it should when we're noticing what comes next um the, our sensations sensations in our body you know when we're feeling sad we'll tend to notice all the sorts of things that chime with um sadness and if we're feeling irritated we'll tend to see things that you know confirm we're right to be irritated and confirmation bias is of course the version of this which is the assumptions that we have will shape what we then perceive and we'll see evidence that confirms our expectations and we'll you know somehow magically not see the rest and this matters so much in the workplace I think many of us know the science but if you think about how it plays out in the workplace it's a recipe for getting into a vicious circle or a virtuous circle that's one of the things you can choose and that's one of the things you can influence because your mindset and what you take into a situation is going to so much determine what seems to happen, what, what you perceive. So, for example, um, you know, there's a, there's a person I coach. Um, she runs a company that's entirely virtual at this point, uh, perhaps like, you know, some people watching this. And so she's on Zoom to Zoom to Zoom to Zoom. She has one conversation, which perhaps is a bit annoying or challenging um you know maybe she has a difficult interaction with the board uh, or maybe she has a conversation with one of her team and it's a little sticky and we all have this sort of thing she goes straight into the next zoom she has this top of mind with that annoyance or disappointment top of mind she then her brain makes sure that she sees everything that confirms that she's right to feel annoyed or disappointed what does she miss well, what we've discovered is you know, she's capable of missing uh, good examples or successes that might be, uh, might be amplified as, as a leader. Um, she's capable of not hearing things that people say or missing people's facial expressions if they don't match her ingoing state of mind. And so we're working hard on saying, OK, well, let's put just a few minutes. I mean, actually, sometimes it can be just a few seconds between meetings so that she can reset her perceptual filters because what's top of mind is going to drive what she notices next. And so she just, she takes a moment to say, okay, what's my real aim? What attitude do I want to project? What assumptions do I carry with me? And, you know, is there anything I need to challenge there? Maybe this person has been a jerk. But maybe this meeting is not going to be bad. Maybe this meeting is going to be good. Maybe this meeting is going to be better. And it seems so small and so trivial, but it makes such a difference to how she then experiences the next uh, conversation. And she just sees much more of what matters. She's not filtering out uh, the things that don't match her ingoing state of mind. It's, it's one of the deepest, most existential interventions that I know. And I, I think it's probably the thing that's changed my life most. Um, I mean, not just professionally, but actually <laughs> personally, probably too. Uh, so that's that's selective attention. I can talk more about that, you know, at any day of the week, um, challenging assumptions and so forth. Um, but the other thing that I would say is coming up a lot at the moment, actually partly jumping off that example, is the need for breaks. Because I think everybody's just so exhausted at the moment that a conversation I've been trying to have with professionals for a couple of decades now is getting easier to have, which is that uh, your, your brain needs a break from time to time in order to function at its best. So, you know, our brain's um, conscious, deliberate system you know, doesn't function so well after a time. It does need to be refreshed. And we know that when we get to the end of a meeting and we're a bit cranky and we're not thinking as clearly and you just feel that people are just not as sharp as they were, were at the beginning. But I feel now that it's easier to have the conversations with, uh, with professionals about the fact that if they get up just for two minutes, and that, the research has shown this, you know, that if you take a break for just two or three minutes, if you intend to come back to a problem, 
then your brain will continue to do encoding and consolidation in the background, which will be useful and will show you more connections when you come back to the problem at hand. And then lo and behold, you have better insight when you come back after a little break. And I think that's a lovely example of how behavioral science really helps people do what they kind of know, but actually perhaps don't do for themselves until they know that it's not an indulgence. This is actually going to not only improve their mood, but it's going to sharpen their performance and the quality of their thinking. So that's something I'm working on a lot uh, at the moment with people, just to understand how to create blocks of time where they're offline, how to uh, make that practical in a busy working environment, you know, how to come off slack from time to time. Uh, you know, this is all sort of very real life stuff and it's actually crucial to be able to do what I was just talking about previously on selective attention because you need a moment to gather yourself and say what do I want to have top of mind knowing that that's going to shape what I I notice next I could go on I mean there are so many more things right there's so many more things but they're, they're the things that are you know coming up a lot you know this week in this week's coaching sessions let's say <laughs> Mm-hmm. No, but I was thinking it's true that um, uh, we we all start to, to to know the impact of just uh, small breaks, and uh, I think it's important also to um, to take some time to to witness uh, how a break impacted just you know the meeting after, etc. To, to make sure that we learn from it and that we don't have to rethink taking a break every every so often I don't know if that's so that true thing. and and I guess you know this gets to the point where you know companies and teams uh, have a lot of power here to to establish some norms around this and you know say okay you know we always start a meeting with a quick round of checking in because that will help people be fully present I mean okay we might know that in principle but there's good science behind that you know again it's, it's about setting your filters your perceptual filters to say okay what is it that's most important for me to notice and pay attention to now um and you know i I do think that uh, i'm seeing some really interesting trends and things that i've been talking about for 20 years now finally people are starting to think about how do we build in norms around you know a friday afternoon without meetings or a uh, a norm that we never run meetings more than 45 minutes or that you know that we build in five minutes at the top of the hour before the next meeting this stuff you know, is now finally happening. And I do think it's going to serve us very well in the future. Yeah, and becoming habits and from norms moving to habits, we see that uh, we see that happening. So the release of um, how to have a good day, so it was in 2016, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic um, happened. And uh, my next question about, is about uh, what you think this big crisis has changed regarding the, the challenge of employee engagement specifically. And uh, maybe what, what have you learned from, from this and uh, what key topics have you been addressing uh, with respect to, to, to this pandemic? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we all feel that the workplace uh, is changing suddenly very, very rapidly. Um, one of the things that's just been so striking to me is how much more we're talking about burnout. Uh, my former colleagues at McKinsey, have been doing some very interesting research into this. Um, And I saw some data recently suggesting that around 25% of employees, and that's across quite a range of countries, this isn't an Anglo-Saxon phenomenon, but it's a a range of countries, around 25% of employees are reporting that they are experiencing symptoms of burnout, at least sometimes. And, you know, obviously some are experiencing it often or all the time. That is tremendously sobering. Um, And I think it is the accumulated effect of the uncertainty and the complexity of the last couple of years uh, and the worry, quite frankly, that that many of us have had about our own health and, you know, our, our loved one's health. And, And also, I would say I don't think the COVID crisis caused this. I think that um, this is revealing a phenomenon that was there before. Uh, You know, there was burnout in the workplace before. What I I think is perhaps a small, it's hard to say that there's a silver lining at all out of COVID, but there's a small silver lining out of COVID, which is that I think we now have more facility in talking about mental health than we did before. And 
I think there's more appreciation of the fact that employees are whole people with complicated lives, juggling loved ones and uh, and personal responsibilities. And I hope that that doesn't go away because I think that there has been a step change in how people are talking uh, about the importance of these issues. And one of the, uh, you know, one of the, the, I think a source of optimism is also in that same survey, 75% of uh, chief HR officers uh, are now seeing mental health as an active priority uh, in the workplaces. So I think that's, you know, that's tremendous. And, um, you know, how has it affected my work? I, I always focused on resilience to a degree because my work was always quite grounded and quite realistic and saying things are a little bit difficult and complicated. What can you do to have a good day within that? Um, so that was always kind of the style of the work that I was doing. But I, I think it really has shifted the quality of conversations that I'm having with clients about this because there's just much more you don't have to take quite so long to get to the place where people are open um I was coaching a, a chief executive no less a, a couple of weeks ago who admitted to me that she was feeling low and honestly you know a couple of years ago that would have taken so long to get to <laughs> <laughs> and and it was so good to be able to go there, name it, work with it, work on it. So I, I do think that that's, uh, that's probably the biggest shift that I've seen. And actually, so you were talking about resilience, and I know you've led a course on uh, how to have a good day in a certain time and uh, uh, addressing this topic uh, in the context of the pandemic still. Uh, people can access this, um, this course uh, on your website. Uh, what are some of the key insights that uh, you wanted to share uh, in that series? Well, again, there are, there are you know, six big topics that I cover. Um, so let me think of one or two to mention. I mean, I think one thing I would say as an overarching comment is that uncertainty in itself is not bad. Um, uncertainty is an amplifier. It, uh, it, it, it increases the intensity of the reaction that we have to both positive and negative stimuli. So, you know, if you think about getting a surprise birthday present or a surprise present in general, uh, that's more exciting than getting a gift that you were expecting. So uncertainty adds uh, intensity to whatever the signal is and so you know obviously that is problematic if it's a negative signal if things are problematic and you don't even know how bad they are uh, that's that's very very stressful so um, all the research suggests that what you want to do is bound the uncertainties the more you can reduce the uncertainties the less they they um, the less stress it's causing your brain the more clearly you're then able to think because often what happens is that you know there's 10 percent that you don't know and there's 90 percent you do and the 90% just gets washed away by the the 10% that is uncertain. And so a lot of the work I do is to help people reconnect with their certainties. And so that might be things that they know. So maybe there are layoffs in prospect. Um, okay, that's very stressful. But they might know what the process is. They might know what the timing is for the decisions. And leaders can really help with this. This is something I work on quite a lot with my clients is how do you give people certainty even through difficult times um, so you can amplify what you know for sure the facts that you know to be true once you do that you write them down you just notice the stress drop you can amplify what people who people are you know their values their sense of continuity and what's important to them so um, that that can be very powerful, and then it can also be very powerful to to pause and think about well, what is there that you can choose here? Because you can choose your attitude, you can choose uh, perhaps you know some rituals, and all of this stuff might sound quite small, but once you add it up and you get people to focus on you know what I know, what I am, what I choose, this allows you, right. It just it gives you back uh, enough clarity to be able to tackle the uncertainty rather than have it sort of whirling around. So that's the sort of thing that I work on a lot. And I have to say, you know, going back to your questions earlier on about what am I, you know, what am I working on uh, in, the, in the tail end, hopefully, of COVID, um, you know, that is obviously working on uncertainty, both helping leaders guide others through and then helping, you know, larger groups of people manage their mental state through it. Yeah, that's that's a. I think that's going to be with us for a long time as an important topic. Uh, first, thank you very very much for for these insights. And uh, his last question, 
before starting uh, the round table is what advice would you give uh, chief people officers who want to start using behavioral science in their work? I think it's a very good question. Um, I mean, there's going to be so much stimulation, so much interesting stuff coming out of uh, watching all of these sessions and being part of all of these sessions that you're organizing. But actually, I would say most chief people officers that I know and I know a few, um, are doing fascinating work, really interesting work in employee engagement, really creative work in thinking about how to help people find meaning and purpose in the workplace and so forth. So it's not, I think, for me to say that any they should be doing anything new. I think chief people officers might consider the possibility of using behavioural science to engage their colleagues on the things that they already know to be good interventions. Because my experience is that uh, chief people officers, chief, chief HR officers, often a big part of the work is actually getting their colleagues on board with the ideas and getting the top team to stand behind it and to role model all of this. So the more that you can use behavioral science, this was always my experience, the more you can use behavioral science, you can explain the, the, the science underpinning, say, a new coaching approach or a new feedback approach or uh, the importance of taking breaks the more likely you are to get quite analytical types to engage and be willing to try a new behaviour and to model a new behaviour to the organisation. So uh, that was such a big part of my practice uh, when I was working at McKinsey. Um, and I think it, it really can help so much in helping the sceptics understand the reason for behavioural change. Yeah, so... Look at what you're already doing and, and, and excavate the, the academic backing for it and then, you know, go forth with that. And yeah. It and, yeah, use it as a good... Um, Scaffold. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you again very much for taking the time to, um, to, to share all these uh, insights with us today. Uh, it was, as you know, a pleasure to... Uh, to we could have to talked for that. hours more, I know, but uh, it's... I know. <laughs> it's wonderful to connect and uh, it's useful for people who are listening. Thank you. So now it's time for uh, our round table. But first, we would like to have a look of Adrian's work. Maybe we could uh, see it. I don't know. If you want to see the uh, work from uh, Adrien, or if we see it uh, at the next pause. So, if it is not the right time, I would like to uh, invite. <laughs> ah, it is the right time, and it works to see it. So, was it not too challenging to write it? In <laughs> Ask him at okay. the end of day two. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. And if you. Uh, Answer to our short questionnaire, you will have the chance Access. to receive oh. the sketch note from uh, Adria. Uh, so now I invite my two uh, friends to uh, join uh, us. Antoine, Antoine Ferrer, who is a global head of behavioral data science, ethics, compliance, and risk at Novartis. And Antoine, and now Olivier Douillet, who is a neuroscientist, behavioral scientist, and the recent co founder of So, Anne. So, send them through the YouTube live chat, and we'll also have live questions here. Thanks. Take it away, Anne. Thank you. Hi again. Uh, and welcome maybe to those uh, who, who have just uh, joined us. Uh, as a complement uh, introduction, uh, Olivier and Antoine, I wanted to mention that you both um, conduct uh, design and conduct studies, uh, but also analyze finding, uh, findings sorry, and turn them into uh, actionable insights uh, at work. And that's what we are going to talk about uh, today. Uh, so first, I'm turning to, to Antoine. Uh, so you've worked a lot on uh, psychological safety. And uh, my, question, my first question to you is, what is employee engagement and how does it relate uh, to psychological safety? Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And uh, super happy to be here with you guys today on News Online as well. So 
I think indeed the first thing to do um, is actually to define a little bit more about what we're talking about. Um, and, and, you know, especially what I like to say um, a bit provocatively when we talk about employee engagement is uh, what I like to say is engage for what to do what exactly, right? And I think that's one of the key learnings of focus from the behavioral science is that when you talk about something, you want to define it as a problem and that problem being related to very specific behaviors as well. And so the example for us, and as you um, heard uh, Eric say in the introduction, I have the longest title in the world, which is probably usually not, not a good sign, right? Um, and it's the fact that for us in ethics, risk, and compliance, then we look at employee engagement from the lens of ethical and moral engagement. Um, are people engaged enough to start caring about the ethical or the moral implication of what they do? That's moral engagement. Uh, do managers care enough to actually behave in the right way when people come to them with the issues? Um, are associates engaged enough uh, when they see something that they feel is not right to raise their voices or their hand to say, hold on, there's something wrong there. So this, that's how we look at employee engagement, right? Um, that's our definition. Other people might have other definition based on the problem at hand they're trying to solve. Um, the other thing then is, and it's a bit easier to define, is psychological safety. Here, you know, the definition is one that's an academic one. It's an established psychological construct that exists there. There's a scale you can use to measure it. And, you know, the, the person that kind of coined the term is Amy Edmondson in the 90s. And so just for the sake of level base, everybody here, psychological safety is formally defined. And, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Olivier, is defined as it's a shared belief within the team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. So the question is, what does it mean, right? And what it means is that, is that it's, some, it's the fact that you just can be yourself at work. It's the fact that you can just say what you think instead of trying to read the room, right? So that's psychological safety. And finally, the question is, well, okay, great, employee engagement, I, I get it, you know, be precise about the behavior you're trying to define, and then psychological safety, very well established. Um, what's the link? Well, the way we came about with psychological safety is that we didn't choose to work on psychological safety. We didn't say, oh, that's really interesting and that's fancy. We want to do some webinars on psychological safety. We looked at what drive employee engagement. We looked at what drive ethical behavior and we realized that psychological safety was a good predictor. It was a good explanatory thing. That was a good input into the output that is uh, employee engagement. And so that's the, what we've been doing. We've been looking at how do we start to improve psychological safety so that it leads as an outcome to more employee engagement. Thank you very much. So Antoine, you, you, you uh, come at employee engage engagement sorry, from this angle. Uh, Olivier, maybe you can share with us, with us the angle from which you come at employee engagement uh, as well. I will build on what Antoine just uh, started to explain, thinking that we need to define things. I'm um, the person that wants to measure things all the time. And for me, what, it's important that if you want to address something, you need to be able to measure it and um, to measure the outcome of your interventions. So my interest is on markers of what can be considered as engagement. As Antoine very accurately mentioned, we all have different definitions of engagement. Uh, about a decade ago, I worked on a program called Science of Engagement, where we define some principles and elements. But at the end of the day, what can be the proxy to engagement is what is of interest to me. As a, someone who measures the brain activity of people in real life settings, it is important for me to measure physiological stress. It is important to me to measure attention and distraction, cognitive load, but also uh, physiological fatigue and mental fatigue. All these elements put together, if you can track them over time, provide you with insights that can predict whether people are going to be engaged or not. Engagement, if you look at it from a measurement perspective, is truly a composite measure. And it's important to be able to build on the definitions and to have tools. And I'm not going to say the right tools because there is no such thing as the right tool, but a combination of measures, be it surveys, uh, physiological measures, interviews, so on and so forth, that all put together will provide you the insights not only to understand people, but to predict disengagement. And I think that is also something that is important. Um, it is often 
not so popular to address things in a negative way. But I'm more interested, for starters, in disengagement than engagement. Understanding what disengages people, because this is something that is easier to spot even sometimes when you don't have physiological measures or data on people's absenteeism, etc. Once you have that, then you can use this data in order to inform the strategies, the change management strategies that are going to help engage people. I think there's something I just want to bounce, bounce on what, just, uh, what Olivier, Olivier just said is, you talked about disengagement, right? And I think that's something that's close to my heart as well. When we try to look at solving a problem with driving different behaviors, that sometimes, and actually most of the time, it's actually helpful to look at what's getting in the way. You know, what is there that prevents us and blocks us to actually behave in a certain way? So indeed, it's not just a question only and if there's people within uh, a child department that are listening to us trying to think about how do I drive employee engagement, how do I drive psychological safety? It's not just going to be about sort of driving forces and motivating people to try, okay, let's be psychologically safe and speak up. It's about looking at that should be our default state at work. That's how we feel when we feel at our best, right? We are engaged. So what's coming in a way when we are in large organization that prevents that? And I think just to say back to the neuroscience part of it, this is where you can cheat. You want to look at markers. And this is where you see some of those markers are more markers of what's disengagement, because maybe that's what's happening in reality in the brain, right? When people behave. Thank you, both of you. So, sorry, Antoine, uh, what is the approach that you've used uh, to improve engagement? Thank you. Um, so again, I think we, we um, uh, whatever our mind series is based on the, fast and, and on the fact and the particularities of how we look at engagement, right? Which is again, I work in ethics, risk and compliance. We look at driving the ethical climate and ethical behavior in the organization. So that's the, the angle and the lens by which we come at it. And I think here to answer to that question, I need to take a couple of steps back on the, because uh, I think it's important for people to understand the scientific journey, right? That's why I like to talk about behavioral science. That's the science first and foremost, right? And so the science of that is the way it started. And you, you cut me short when it's 10 minutes, I'm rambling. So hopefully I'm not too long. But <laughs> Or maybe you do, Olivia. I trust you will, right? Yeah, you will. He will. Um, and so basically, we kind of started like uh, a couple of years ago. And in the way we came at it is, um, you know, we want to drive ethical behavior. Right? It's a bit similar to, oh, we want to drive employee engagement. Great. Okay. What's the problem in particular? What do we know about both ethical and unethical behavior in the organization? So the first step we did is we measured, right? So it's not rocket science. We launched a global survey, 60 question, 12 psychological construct on the one hand, including psychological safety. All the predictors of like moral engagement and, you know, fairness, trust, all justice, sense of control and all that. On the other hand, we measured reported behaviors. How many times did you see something that felt wrong in your organization? What did you do? To whom did you speak to? Oh, you spoke to your manager. How did you react or she react then? Uh-huh. How do you make you feel? So we have lots of data there. And then from there, we realized, oh, there is a link between psychological safety, that was the first finding, and speaker behavior. It's intuitive, but it did not exist in the literature. It was not there. There was no paper looking at that. And so we found through the survey and other measures that actually in an environment where people feel safer, they tend to speak up the most about problem. Great, solve the problem. Psychological safety is what we need so that when there's misconduct happening, we can address it very early. We don't let the problem mutate and fester and creating you know, other issues on the line. This is where I get really interesting. The catch-22 then, I'm starting rambling, I know. The catch-22 then is that in an environment where you need people to be the safest, right? It is where they are the less safe because in an environment where they're more, there is more unethical behavior, this is when they feel the less safe to actually speak up about something. So where we need people to speak up the most, this is where they can speak up the least. And this is why we decided, and coming to your point, we need to do something about it. We need to increase psychological safety. And so what we've done is something that we do a lot in pharma, Every day, actually, and we spend like millions, if not billions on that, but we do barely in the corporate world, including in the Valtis, which is we run a randomized controlled trial, placebo-controlled group, right? So we define an experiment to say, what can we do to get people to feel safer? Um, and we identify the role of the manager there. And we did, I'll cut it short, but basically we did a control group of telling managers you're part of a study. And then we had two interventions. One was, in the next one-to-one, -one, dear manager, treat people as individual 
ask their question about what they want, what they need, and you know, how you can help them. The other intervention was more removing blocker, back to my point initially. What's getting in the way of you doing your work? What's getting in the way of you having an impact? And then we randomized across a thousand teams across 50 countries, you know, across everything. And then what we found is that a small intervention, which is here just an email to manager asking them to approach their next one-to-one -one with their teams differently, was enough to increase substantially psychological safety in teams. But here's the kicker. Two more interesting things. One, it did not just increase psychological safety. It increased trust in the manager. It increased you know, whether people consider the manager as a role model, whether people will recommend the organization. So it's just not one thing. Everything is linked, right? Because there's no biomarker for psychological safety. There's no psychological safety neuron. It fires all over the place, right? Um, and then the other thing, which is also really interesting, back to, I know you have a point usually on personalization. What worked was different based on not you know what kind of team it was but it was different based on what was the initial level of psychological safety they had in teams so people that were low on psychological safety individuation works brilliantly people and teams that were already high on psychological safety then it was about removing blocker again which makes beautiful intuitive sense but when you look at the data you go like oh my god this is great so that's what we did and i'll pause there thank you very much and i, I think i i love the fact that um uh, the main difference in the impact um, uh, of these actions is not um, based on differences of culture. Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier to me when we were preparing that um, uh, culture didn't really matter in, uh, in, in the impact. What mattered is uh, the level of uh, initial psychological safety in the groups that you were comparing. I really love this. And, and, and that's something you can predict, right? If you want to run webinars on psychological safety, do training on psychological safety, you're never going to think about oh, I've got to separate that by the initial level of psychological safety. You're going to say, oh, people work in sales and then they work in marketing and they're like generation X and Y and, and, and that country, and that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Olivier, do you have any reaction uh, on what uh, Antoine just said? I think we have to commend um, the work Antoine is doing because he's presenting it as something very simple and his point on this not being mainstream at all in the corporate world is actually true. Um, so, um, I love the fact that Novartis is walking the talk. <clears throat> the fact that they're using large-scale measurements in order to inform the policy. And uh, further to the point that Antoine raised on ethics, we also have to address the point that is rarely addressed of ethical tools. The fact that if you want to use tools to measure, like I do, you need also to make sure that those tools are ethical that they are non-discriminatory, that their outcome is going to benefit everyone. And this is one of the key issues in HR is, I don't know about you, but I'm not the same person when I join an organization and 10 years later or three months later, later or I'm not the same person on a Monday and a Tuesday because things happen. Yet, there are tools that have been discussed and challenged and that's an understatement by the scientific literature of over the past 40 years that are still used in uh, um, corporate human resources, personality tests. Please don't mention MBTI. Con cognitive tests that capture at best what a person is at a certain moment when they are being hired. And someone uh, can also uh, say that sometimes you don't even meet or and having the interview because you'll be blocked by the results of a test. And the results of this test are gonna follow you during your entire life in the corporation, yet you change. So first, these tests have to be reliable. Uh, science seems not to agree. Second, there are one measure, even if they are reliable, there are just one measure in time at one point in time. So my job is to personalize the interaction in the workplace is to create tools that can measure how people feel in the moment, to empower machines to sense how we feel as users. Again, because I'm not the same person in the morning and the afternoon. Hence, if I'm operating with a connected system or a digital environment, to empower the system to sense how I feel and maybe to tell me, hey, this is not the right moment for this very meticulous task because you're a bit distracted, you're a bit stressed. So go for a walk and I, um, thanks to my teams in the previous uh, and current companies I'm working with, um, been able to scale this in organizations. 
The fact is that if we can inform people with the right data and leverage this data for good in an ethical fashion, meaning that it can be reproduced, it's not just a matter of one data point in time that defines who I am in the eyes of my CHRO, then we can make progress. Because overall, it goes down to one point. When people are being hired and you want them to engage in their team, in the work of a company, the first effort they need to do and to make is to adapt to the workplace, to adapt to the physical environment, to adapt to the social environment. But now, thanks to technology, AI, behavioral and brain sciences, we can add another level to that, which is to empower the workplace to adapt to people, create responsive tools, responsive workplaces. Because if you empower a machine to sense how a person feels, then you can customize the work experience and it increases engagement. But back to the point, and I will stop here, it removes some of the hurdles or it helps you jump over these hurdles because there are hurdles that you can work as much as you want with the best intentions that are not so easy to remove. I really like the work that you do, uh, Olivia, and I think it's really the future of what's going to happen in organization in maybe... It's actually know, my present and the yeah. present of many organizations, just saying. Maybe, you know, five, 10, 20 years, 30 years, I don't know how long it will take, but I think that's what's going to come. And, and if I may, I think there's nothing better that encapsulate and should encapsulate and make it easy for people to understand what you just said about the fact that it isn't about traits, you know, or personality, what defines us. When you think about psychological safety, let's make it very clear, it's not a trait that's ascribed to an individual. It's not even how you feel as an individual. It's characterized a team dynamic. So by itself, psychological safety is extremely context dependent, right? So you cannot look at somebody and say, let me look at this person, Olivier in general, I'm gonna increase the psychological safety. That depends, I'm here talking to you today, do I feel safe? Maybe yes, maybe not. Maybe I, talk, I cross the door over there and I talk to other people, do I feel safe? It depends, my wife calls me on the phone, I feel very safe similarly, I can tell them something. So it varies very, 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 sorry, varies widely during the day, right? And so we have to cater for that. And, and, and also adapt to the fact that it's very, it seems very obvious to say it, but sometimes it's good to remind the obvious that we're so different. And a lot of solutions that are offered in, uh, you know, seminars, workshops to deal with biases um, or one size fits all. It's one person that decides that everyone in the team will have to behave this way. The imposter syndrome is one of the craziest thing for me. I'm one of these people who needs to think like I'm an imposter because this is what drives me to always learn, to always go back and work. And some people are inhibited by the imposter syndrome. So if one of my managers had come one day say, hey, you need to attend this seminar workshop where we're going to help you get rid of your imposter syndrome, it might have helped some of my, of my colleagues. But for me, that would have been a disaster. I care for my imposter syndrome. This is what drives me. But I understand also that some people struggle with it. And the one size fits all approach to dealing with issues across the whole span of psychological safety, etc., will never work. And generally, as soon as you mention something, you know, it's like those people who come and say, we're going to unbias your team. Um, seriously? <laughs> Uh, biases are like gravity, they're here, you know, you don't, you can deny gravity, but if you jump off a cliff, uh, gravity will remind to you that it exists. Uh, you can't remove a bias, but generally there are others that emerge. It's like when you stop smoking and you gain weight, you get rid of a problem and you get another one. With biases, it's the same. Biases are who we are. So don't remove the biases, help people have a judo approach, it's use the power in order to turn them into something positive rather than this whole false promise of unbiasing. Unbias does not exist. Objectivity does not exist. Neutrality don't exist. So let's set some goals when we help people that are realistic. No, you're getting, you're getting me started. I want to say something about that, but I will not because then <laughs> I'm, I'm really not excited about that. No, but I will restrain and then, and, and then if we have time, I'll come back to that. But you're absolutely right.
Do you actually want to react to that? I have, he I just, have one he last just, question. He just reacted. I he told said you, don't I'm get absolutely me right. Don't get That's me started. That's the one thing I, I get no, from no, this no. point. Just, just to say that I wholeheartedly agree with what Olivier has been saying on, on biases, for example. And, and I don't know where we are today, but it used to be all the rage uh, a couple of years back when I started in, into... Uh, uh, really seriously applying behavioral science. It was all this talk about unconscious bias, which was a very narrow approach to biases. But I think more fundamentally, as you say, yes, we have biases. And yes, at times in certain situation, it might make sense to try to improve that judgment by thoughtfully thinking about how you think. Most of the time it fails because you've got to start thinking about how you think, which you never do, right? And so the problem with biases is that it can focus entirely the problem around individuals, where the solution is about designing environments to fit with the individuals, not try to change the individuals. And that's why as well, I don't, don't really talk much about behavioral economics when I, my job, I talk about behavioral science because I'm not focusing on this, how we depart from rationality biases, which is a straw man of how we function. I'm more interested in taking roots in the biology of our behavior, which is what Olivia is doing, so yeah. Great transition to my next question, which is, um, Antoine, uh, so you, you've been talking to us about uh, some so this huge experiment that you've been doing and, and, and these actions that you've been leading. Are you currently experimenting new things? Uh, what are they? Uh, do you have any results already? Yeah, of course. Um, so maybe I'll talk about something that we're about to experiment. And uh, um, it's something I talked about earlier. Um, in, in the interview. And so basically, once we design the experiment to try to improve psychological safety, large-scale experiment, well, the first step is how do we scale up? Right? That's the first thing, right? Let's make sure we apply this finding in the rest of the organization and not sort of go on with the next experiment. But as we do this, the next one would be, and as we identify with our survey across Novartis, is that what's essential, again, is whether people say something when they see something, right? That's, what, that's the fail-safe of any organization, right? You're not gonna be able to prevent 100% of anything happening, but then you gotta make sure that when this happens, then there's somebody who's gonna catch that and raise his, his or her voice. And in that, we talk about the next experiment is gonna be about what we call sort of manager micro-behaviors, which is how does the manager react when somebody come to them? And what we see is that in Novartis, but it's true, I bet, in any large organization, any organization, that when somebody goes to their manager with like, hey, boss, I've seen something, I don't really feel great about it, uh, what's the manager reaction in some of the case? They don't do the right thing, they do the human thing. And they say, oh God, you're bringing a problem to me now. <laughs> I don't want to hear about that. Don't mix things up, don't be oversensitive. That happens quite frequently, right? And so how do we help manager do the right thing by making it this thing, the human thing, a natural thing for them to do? So again, we're not going to go to manager and tell them, oh, you're biased. So let's try to correct those biases. How do we make sure that we design that environment around them so that they can actually tell their teams, well, thank you for raising the problem. It's really important for me to hear about that and I will do something about it. So that's the next RCT we're designing that we plan to, to do uh, so, uh, either towards the end of the year or next year and I can come back with more results when I have them. Or not. Please do. Uh, thank you very much. I have also um, one, one question for, for you, Olivier. Um, you, you've recently uh, launched Inclusive Brains, and I thought this was a great opportunity for, for you to talk to us a bit more about, about it, because I think it's a, it's a fantastic uh, project. Thank you. So what we're doing is we're creating a new generation of brain-computer interfaces. It's a combination of algorithms, artificial intelligence, and biosensors to help people who have lost the ability to use their hands or to speak, to control, to mind control their computers, their workstation, their vehicles. This way, they can enter or re-enter the workforce. There is a huge amount of a population who suffers from disabilities and who are excluded from the workforce, not just because Generally, people with disabilities have problems finding jobs, but also because the tools are not adapted. So thanks to technology, we're able to make workplaces more inclusive. And rather than just running around and uh, giving workshops on be more inclusive, and this is how to be inclusive, um, we provide the technological approach, the, the tech innovation, but we also realize that it's not just about providing the tools. 
you also need to help the people around the teams, to your point, uh, get used to working with an augmented human being. Because some people are not uh, quite at ease, sadly, when they see a disabled person equipped with a brain-computer interface that outperforms them. It's a little bit the problem that some of the people in track and field had when they saw the first runners with prosthetics run faster than them. So we have the technological in um, innovation, but also the social innovation uh, that is leveraging behavioral and brain sciences in order to understand what the blockers are, what uh, we can do in order to help people. Once again, technology in itself is just a tool. Um, if technology is not adapted and adopted by people, nothing's gonna happen. And this is what Inclusive Brands is about, is making the um, workplace more inclusive thanks to technology and with a workplace that adapts to people. Thank you very much to, to both of you. I'm arriving to my final uh, question, which is going to be to both of you too, um, which is, do you have, like the usual question actually, do you have uh, an advice for people who are willing to, to drive engagement uh, at work? Would you have like a, one single thing that they can do or a range of things that they can do that would uh, be impactful to do that? Yeah, so uh, I don't have one single thing, but a couple of things. And I think we've alluded to them through the conversation, but it might be good to say it one more time because I think we never say it enough. Uh, and I'll be sure because I can see the timer blinking, it's turning red. I'm afraid we're going to explode if I you know, keep talking. So I'll try to be <laughs> brief there. It's really putting pressure on me now. Um, <laughs> it's fine. You're safe. I feel You're safe. safe I'm safe. No, I'm safe. Um, so basically, this is about, again, a couple of things. First, define the problem precisely, right? Especially if there's maybe in the room here or online, I don't know how many people, I don't know where the camera is, where do I look at, but basically people online, if you guys are working in the child department, next time somebody comes to you with an idea and tell you, we want to create employee engagement, we want to drive psychological safety, please ask the question, what's the problem you're trying to solve on the specific behaviors you're trying to drive, right? You've got to be more precise. Uh, the other thing is once you've done that, is then again don't just focus on motivating people and adding fuel and you know trying to make them you know no focus on the blockers how do you remove the friction right mm -hmm. um and then finally again if you're working in a large organization to drive psychological safety and engagement you don't need to do webinars on psychological safety you don't need to do trainings on psychological safety you don't even need to talk about it just make sure it's what people experience it's like the oscars there's music Well, focus more on the outcomes than the words themselves, because sometimes they are hard uh, to, to define. Uh, make sure that everything you do is ethical, is legal, and it does not hurt people, and it enhances, improves their lives. Then you can call it behavioral economics, neuroscience, anything. It will work one way or another if you tick all these boxes. And ultimately, it's about personalization. Um, you wouldn't send someone who is 1.70 meters in a dangerous factory wearing an outfit that has been designed for someone who is two meters tall. No one would do that. So how come when it comes to an office, we give everyone the same desk, the same computer, the same everything? It's about personalization. And now final advice, if you really want to understand uh, the dynamics of what is going on to uh, in, in an office, in the workplace, I would uh, highly recommend my favorite author when it comes to uh, workplace, it's Ricky Gervais. So watch The Office over and over and you'll see a lot about behavior at work. And employee disengagement. Exactly. Thank you very much again. Uh So I'm going to turn to the audience for questions and uh, starting with a question that we have online. Uh, can you give us concrete examples of tools or indicators of employee engagement? Um, I mean, I, I guess we kind of answer that question a little bit as well, but just to come back to that, once you define a little bit more precisely employee engagement um, and say you're interested in uh, psychological safety, then it's easy. You've got a scale that exists, right? 
so we're talking about indicators part, right? There's, there's a scale that exists out there that's fairly robust, it's a six point scale to measure psychological safety. And it's done fairly well, so it's that's not like a, you know, if you do a survey, you'll get to what people really feel there, and it's gonna be quite effective and quite, you know, research related to outcomes that matter. So it might be as simple as that. You wanna look for an indicator, don't oversimplify, right? Uh, make sure you rely on established research and try to find what's out there, what's been you know, verified and established, what's predictive, and turn to science to look at how they've actually measured the things and how does this relate to behaviors once again. So that would be a, a picking on the indicator part. I don't know, Olivia, if you got anything around the tools part or, or maybe something else. I think that's very important. And interestingly enough, um, you can measure things that are quite counterintuitive and we need to address the elephant in the room. We talk about uh, psychological safety a lot, but it's a worker environment and performance matters as well. But what matters more than performance is sustainable performance, meaning performance that can last over time. And in order to measure sustainable performance, there are so many indicators that you can look at. Absenteeism uh, on the long run. Uh, the, the, whether people deliver on time or not. What we did in, uh, with some of our clients is to measure the level of stress and distraction of people in the workplace. And we realized that micromanagement was not only a source of stress when the manager was coming, stress was going up, but also a source of distraction, not just when the manager was coming, but when people knew the manager was coming. So we got all, all these indicators. Another thing that we realized in a different context was the fact that if you allow people to arrive a bit late, not to clock in exactly on time, as it can be uh, the case in some offices, uh, they start the day with a significant lower uh, stress level and they perform better. So if you give a little bit of flexibility on time, people actually perform better on the long run. And these are neurophysiological measures that have been repeated across countries, across continents. Um, at the end of the day, it's all about being able to find the right indicators. And the ones I shared are not universal. Um, you don't use the same indicators in a factory or on a trading floor. And, and I know we, we want to get to the next question, but something really important because it's close to my heart when it comes to sustainable performance. Well, psychological safety doesn't just help you with ethics. It's not like an ethics thing, right? Because people don't, don't just think about whether they can say something, raise an ethical concern. They think about whether they can say what they think. And if the bus is a bad idea for the next project or the next brand, well, maybe next time they'll say, uh, Buzz, this is just rubbish, right? So that's good for performance, right? And imagine, to your point, it's distracting to feel not psychologically safe. Imagine how much time is wasted in an organization where you're just trying to read the room instead of pursue the mission. It's immense, right? So it leads to both performance, but sustainable performance over time. I know we're not answering the question at all, but anyway, here's the next one. All right, uh, I'll take another online question. Can increased employee engagement be perceived by employees as the company's desire to increase the profitability of teams? If so, how can we avoid this negative first perception? It's very interesting because this is very meta in a sense. Uh, because managers or C-levels don't feel psychology safe to speak about profitability because it's going to be ill-perceived. Uh, and I think psychological safety needs to go both ways. Um, every employee needs to be safe, but also management needs to be safe to talk about the topics. If you're in the corporate world, performance, sustainable performance, but also profitability are things that matter and they need to be addressed. And of course, we can work on the perception and how to explain to people uh, why they matter. The second point is um, profitability will be better accepted by employees if they are associated to the benefits. So work on your incentives. No, you, right, and I think the other thing to, to say here, Olivier, is that sometime in the corporate world, we have a tendency to, rightly so, I guess, and understandably so, that we bring everything we do in the lens of performance and profit. And how many times I've seen like some of the work that I've been doing and people going like, hold on, so I guess that increased performance? And is that why we're doing this? Can we tell them what's the business case for that? People will buy into this. And I'm like, no, we just do this because it's the right thing to do. That's it, right? And it doesn't hurt the profit. It's just the right thing to do. So sometimes we always tend to, to, to go back to that where 
it's not necessarily uh, the thing that we have to do. And then I had something else really interesting to say, but I forgot. So I guess we'll leave it there. Now, now looking, so you're, you're in a big corporation. Uh, these days I work uh, in startups and it's also important uh, to realize and to share with uh, the, the, the members of, of our teams that profitability matters for the survival of their jobs too. It's not just a matter of ideology when you talk about profitability, it's about the, the true behavioral science, meaning uh, your behavior at the moment is uh, to work and to contribute. If there is no company, this behavior disappears. And again, it has to go both ways and psychological safety or C-level founders, et cetera, in startups is also a major issue that is very rarely discussed. And, and, and I don't think, you know, thinking about psychological safety and, and whether that's for profit or not, I, I think everybody would agree there's not, there's never sort of the right amount of fear in organization. <laughs> so we better work on that. It's something that's great, isn't it? All right. Thank you very much. The, the question that I see could be a very short one, so I'll still read it. And please. Depends have, on us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, can you recommend a training on behavioral science? I will keep on uh, offering a kind of out of phase recommendation. Uh, the best social psychology book, Asterix et la Zizanie. You know what? It's such a drop mic moment. I don't want to say anything else. Uh, so maybe, no, no training. Just uh, start reading books, first of all. And you've read enough books, maybe you can get some training. But books are good. All right. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you for the questions. And uh, thank you, everyone.